He's a professor of structural engineering at Seoul National University. This is a very, very strong university in, in, in Korea. Uh, one of the top in the world and probably the top in, in South Korea. I had the privilege to visit the university last uh, September. And uh, Professor Kang, he uh, is professor at Seoul National University. And before that, he worked as assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma. And also he was adjunct professor at University of Illinois, Illinois Urbana-Champaign in the US. And he received his PhD from University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And he's a bachelor from Seoul National University. <clears throat> and uh, he uh, he's recipient of, of many uh, prestigious awards. Uh, including MEDAR for the most meritorious paper uh, by the American Concrete Institute and the Kenneth Bondi Award for the most meritorious uh, technical paper on post-tensioning uh, from the Post-Tensioning Institute in 2013. He is a fellow of the ACI and PTI and member of the EU Academy of Science uh, he is the editor in chef for Journal of Wind and Structures. We serve together as editors on of this journal, uh, and also on the Journal of Structural Integrity, and associate editor for PTI Journal. He has published over 140 international journal papers, either as author or co-author. And um, his talk today will be related to uh, pre-stressed uh, post-tension concrete uh, research. And I think this is one of the areas uh, that he is um, uh, has very, very strong expertise on it. Okay, so, you know, it's middle of the night in Korea. It's uh, 3 a.m. in the morning. And uh, he was, uh, you see, very kind to, to wake up middle of the night to go to his office and uh, present to us this uh, seminar. So welcome, Thomas. And now I will pass it to you to give us your nice presentation. Thank you for nice intro. Thank you for a nice introduction, Professor Damatia. Uh, this is my great pleasure to give a general seminar because I heard that there are a variety of uh, different areas of uh, students and and faculty. So I try to be generalized in this talk so that. Um, uh, everybody can follow my uh, presentation. And I, I, ho I hope that it's actually a presentation at the University of West Western Ontario, but at least I can give this kind of a seminar virtually so we can meet even in this uh, pandemic. So it, it's a nice platform so that we can communicate. So today I'm gonna talk about recent advances in post-tension concrete research. Uh, there are some technical contents, but I try to be uh, general, as I told you, and try to skip a little bit of the details, uh, but uh, just uh, wanted to show you uh, how the research uh, in this area is going, okay? So basically the contents includes uh, assessment of a stiffness, strengths, and behavior. Behavior means uh, some kind of a, a behavior inside that structure, for example, interaction between post tensioning tendon and concrete. Also, seismic behavior, ductility, those kind of behavior. We care much about the ductility when we talk about the structures and the recent advances in Seoul National University. So this is a mono single strand tendon anchor so that per anchor, we have a one strand and you have a one wedge. And right hand side, it's an encapsulated plastic coated um, anchor to prevent corrosion damage. And also the strand is uh, coated with the uh, grease and plastic. Um, this anchor actually is developed by, my, by myself and my students. And we went through the, all the performance tests, including the fatigue. So it's uh, actually being used 
in the real actual construction site. So typically we prefer using flat plates because it's a very, its formwork is very simple and that expedites the uh, construction and everything makes uh, very, uh, every, uh, the post-tensioning makes uh, everything easier in terms of the construction. And as you see, it's uh, covered by the plastic and then a little larger uh, plastic cover here because uh, at that point, we strip up the uh, plastic cover so that bare strand will be exposed and that penetrate through the uh, encapsulated anchor. And then this plastic thing is uh, to create the uh, pocket so that later the tensioning jacking equipment can uh, access to the, uh, the back of the anchor so that it can grip the, str the strand and then pull the cable and then which is the uh, staying there and then it's just anchored inside the, the anchorage. And this kind of a, uh, unbonded, this is unbonded system. And it's also popular in Canada. Unbonded post-tensioning cable is very flexible unlike the reinforcing bar so that it can curve horizontally also vertically so that a vertical profile can create the uh, some kind of uplift to fourth. It can transfer the gravity load in the middle of the span to the end of the span so that it transfers to the column more effectively. So that has a major advantage of uh, using post-tensioning, uh, which is the deflection control. And also it's very flexible so that it can go around the opening. And when you have a large curvature, just imagine it's, uh, when it's uh, flattened, it wants to push in that direction for the uh, uh, opening area so that there's a rebar, additional rebar to make sure it's a uh, holding at that location. At slab column connection region in flat plate structure, usually it's a little vulnerable to punching shear failure, two-way action of a punching so that uh, punching shear reinforcement is provided in the form of a stud rail, studs used in structure steel structure. And there are a little bit of congestion, but that's a kind of important details, especially at this connection region. And that's the fabrication process of a unbonded single strand tendon. Bare strand is pulled out from the drum and then it's uh, sprayed by the uh, grease so that it gives a, a very little friction. And then also sprayed by the uh, liquid, uh, plastic and then it's a hardened right away. So extrusion process and then after that, one, this is water. So it's cooled down and then hardened and then it's just uh, uh, also uh, actually kept in a storage with the uh, this kind of coil, the drum. And then they cut off the uh, at right lengths and then uh, put the anchors on each end and then that could be uh, uh, shipped to the, uh, the job site by the uh, contractors or maybe the factory sends out that. Um, bridge structures also using a lot of post-tensioning application. This is a casting left-hand side photo shows casting place construction. With post-tensioning you see that ducts and then there's a form of and then for the concrete and also uh, these ducts will be connected with the ducts which will be placed inside the formal so that actually that later they insert the strands, multiple strands in a duct and pull the cable. Uh, box segmental bridge also using post-tensioning, but this is the precast mostly so that each segment by segment is attached by use of the post-tensioning, uh, especially at the top so that it's a cantilever, the balance the cantilever. And later when it's a connected uh, over the multiple spans, and then they use the long tendon to make that whole segments integrated. So this kind of a post-tension structures are not researched as much uh, as uh, reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete, the research history is more than 100 years, uh, maybe 120 years. The pre-stress, pre-tension system, which is the uh, just bell strand, which is pulled in the factory uh, anchored in a steel abutment and then put the concrete right on top of the 
tensioned steel. That kind of pre-tension system also was getting popular from early to mid 20th century. But post-tensioning system is uh, uh, emerging a uh, latter half of uh, 20th century. So not much research. So we're interested in how we can uh, use the stiffness properties for our design. So this is a flat plate system, three-dimensional structure. Uh, engineers want to uh, design this using two-dimensional frame because it's uh, convenient for them. Also, it is not too bad to be modeled as a two-dimensional two element so that we just uh, treat it as a beam element with the effective uh, slab width. And also, we got to consider the cracking. You know, the concrete cracks always. Uh, especially reinforced concrete uh, that's supposed to crack. Otherwise, we cannot design really. Um, post tension system is a little different story. Cracking is not really assumed, and we assume uncracked stiffness for post tension system. So, anyway, irregular structure with the uh, column, non uh, regular column pattern, so that uh, architects can do whatever they want to do with this uh, plan layout. But when we model this, we just connect each column to column with the two-dimensional beam element with the effective stiffness. So that that resembles the right stiffness of the overall stiffness. Also, uh, it, it can be implemented in the finite element commercial software very easily. And what kind of a stiffness can be used? Every different researchers have different models and there's a little bit of variation and I wanted to uh, actually, to quantify this kind of pr property, when I was a PhD student at UCLA, like that was uh, already 18 years ago. So that effective slab with factor can be assessed. I call that alpha factor. Also for cracking contribution, that beta factor is assessed. And columns, that's a typical flexural uh, slender members, so very popular column model, already proven to be very uh, accurate. So that I use just uh, the existing column model. And then I did the uh, shaking table test. I, uh, um, well, maybe that's uh, not played right there, um, but it's a shaking table test at UC Berkeley because uh, we ran it uh, from the UC Berkeley and then I did reinforced concrete, two story, two bay structure and also post-tension flat plate two-story, two-base structure. And uh, the research was very successful uh, to allow for me to assess the uh, this kind of alpha and beta factor for post-tension. That was uh, almost like a first attempt to quantify this kind of a properties uh, in the frame scale. And that's uh, basically uh, used for our modeling studies also. Uh, and then it's uh, finally implemented in the, uh, the guidelines and the, uh, uh, the standard of ASC and ACI. So that was a, a nice outcome that I can finally propose to engineers about that. This um, study is about the deflection. Deflection, when we predict the deflection, also we want to know the stiffness of the structure, each floor. And when we model the whole plan of the uh, very large structure, it actually takes a lot of time, a lot of uh, uh, running time and then also modeling time. So take out, taking out the uh, only the one panel and then we compare with the whole structure so that we can just go with the uh, one span modeling, one panel modeling more effectively and eliminating the, the time of the uh, uh, modeling and the uh, uh, assessment. So entire floor modeling and panel modeling is compared and it was very compatible and we were very confident go with the panel modeling. So we uh, incorporate the uh, actual concrete strengths and the elastic models of uh, Korean concrete properties and also considering the shoring of the, uh, the floors. So the transferring of a gravity load, also construction load, fresh concrete, those kind of things are considered very carefully. So that, for example, when we have uh, the next pour, we don't have a deflection because of a shoring. And then we do the post-tensioning. 
then post tension gives actually a little bit of a camber. So it actually is a negative deflection, which means upward deflection. And we have another shorting on top of the concrete. Then we have a little bit of a uh, deflection because of a whole, this set of a shorting is a deflect a little bit downward. And repeating that kind of a process, uh, uh, we can model deflection very uh, accurately. But here I assume that there is no cracking. So that I just go with the elastic modeling with the assumed the properties, the material properties. So post-tensioning and shorting and everything is considered, but with no uh, cracking assumption. But also we measure in the field, the, the same structure uh, installing the uh, LVDP and displacement gauges. And we compare with the modeling and indeed, the post-tension flat plate system is uh, very free from cracking. That's a great advantage because uh, uh, the immediate deflection is almost half of the RC, given the same span. And long-term deflection is also proportional to the immediate deflection. That means that has a strong advantage in terms of the deflection so that we can increase the span length. We can minimize the slab thickness, and we are free from the deflection and long-term deflection problem. And that is uh, okay with the uh, also design criteria. And for post-tension, long-term deflection factor lambda can be, this is a RC equation, which is uh, uh, standardizing the ACI. And that can be actually modified a little bit because of post-tensioning um, performance is much better. So um, I just explained about the stiffness research in terms of a lateral deflection by seismic force and also deflection by gravity, but considering other effects like post-tensioning, shoring, and so on. And finally, we can propose a better modifier factor that helps engineers to, to better design cost-effective and better performing structures. How about the strengths? The modeling between the strength and the concrete is a little bit complicated compared with the RC. RC is also complicated, very difficult to assess, uh, especially there's a bond slip and also cracking. And on bonded system, there's a friction uh, because of uh, uh, curvature and also inherent friction, uh, that co that's called wobble friction. So those kind of a modeling is not that easy. So it should be carefully done. And we were successful to accomplish that kind of a modeling and then compare with the very old test data. Because as I said, not many tape database uh, data are available uh, in terms of unbounded system, especially unbounded system. Um, so I, I had to use all available the research outcomes uh, over the two or three decades. And that modeling uh, using a abacus uh, is uh, demonstrated. And then we valid, uh, we confirmed that it's a valid T, uh, especially the, the friction modeling. And that was also compared with the New Zealand test data and finally, we try to model the slack column connection behavior, which is very complex, three-dimensional. There's interaction between unbounded tendon and concrete. Also, it's a two-way punching shield behavior. And especially on the earthquake lateral sway, uh, there's an unbalanced moment, which is not balanced. It's a moment reverser. That is uh, not transferred by, transfer by only flexure. There's also torsional transfer on the side of the column. Portion of stress is the same as a shield stress. That actually uh, makes the connection more vulnerable to punching shear failure, especially on one side of the connection. So this is a kind of a, a disastrous failure. Uh, and then the Northridge failure, this building is demolished uh, eventually because it cannot be, it was uh, uh, judged to be uh, not used further. So that was a large damage to the building owners and so on. So as I said, lateral on the lateral sway, you have a moment reverser. That kind of unbalanced moment is transferred by torsion on the side of the column. So that actually 
increase the punching shear stress and not 100% of unbalanced moment, but portion of the kind of a here gamma V factor is a how much percentage of unbalance is transferred by that kind of a torsional behavior. Um, that should be modeled very carefully. And then we have uh, several models and implemented in this uh, modeling. And of course, not really model using cyclic um, finite element analysis, but more like a, a monotonic backbone curve comparison is done. Because uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's a little waste to try to model cyclic behavior too much in detail. I care more about the connection behavior and, and also the, this kind of a factors, how we can improve that for, for practicing engineers. So that was focusing this study. And then experimental data, you actually measure force or displacement or maybe moment values, but not exact stress. Well, strain can be measured, but two-dimensional member, you have a side of the member, but this is more like a slab. How can you install the sensors, strain sensors to measure the, the distortion inside the concrete? That's not easy. But when you demonstrate your modeling is really good at modeling real test data, you can look inside the three-dimensional modeling. And that way I can assess the uh, factors and maximum shear stress and so on. So that was uh, this research's outcome so that we were getting more comfortable for modeling of a slack column connection behavior or so better estimate the strengths of the connection. How about the research about the sliding and friction behavior? Because uh, bonded system, even grouty bonded system uh, interaction between strand and concrete is a very difficult subject. So I wanted to measure the tendon stress directly from the, the, the actual construction. So fiber optic sensor is embedded at the, the center wire, which is a seven wire strand, and one wire is replaced by the carbon fiber reinforced polymer with the optical sensor and that I call smart tendon. And then rest of the six uh, strand is the same as the, uh, the regular strand. So I installed in a real building um, for the long tendon and short tendon and measured the, the change of the uh, tendon stress over time and also the, along the lengths. So that research uh, is very useful uh, when we compare with the, uh, our modeling efforts. So this is a more like a codified friction modeling. Um, I don't want to go into too much details, but it's a more like a finite element analysis. And we needed to codify this uh, using our MATLAB software. Otherwise, uh, um, it's a, uh, using like commercial software that's not perfect for this kind of a study. So simple supported beam with the profile we try to compare with the theory. And for example, there's a friction loss and our modeling performance was compared. Also there's anchor sitting loss. When you grip this uh, strand by using the wedge, there's a little bit of suction at the time of the anchoring. So that kind of a suction behavior is modeled like this perfectly. So develop the finite element formulation uh, was a, very comparable to theory. And then we uh, did some uh, demonstration of uh, experimental results. This is a test done by a University of Texas uh, in 1990s, okay? And two-way span, I think, a beam and slab members, okay? And the profile, profile is not perfectly smooth. In the modeling, there's a little bit of variation. That's to create the uh, inherent friction, not caused by the curvature. Even though you have a straight tendon, there's a little bit of a friction. So pulling end has a higher stress than the fixed end. That kind of a modeling should be done by creating a little bit of a variation. And I call the wobble effect. And here is the results between the 
analytical wizard. Analytical wizard means using the experimental data, we input that data into the theory. So it's actually mixed analytical and experiment data. And final element analysis from our uh, final element formulation, and it's uh, very uh, well modeled. And also using that, I compare with the existing other um, specimen in New Zealand, China, and in the US and Canada probably. And also I compare the, the tendon stress behavior near the anchor, or uh, I'm sorry, the near the, the point load location. At the point load location, there's a, a little bit of a peak of the stress. And when we don't assume any friction there, that cannot be modeled really. But with the right friction coefficient, that peak can be measured. The overall behavior was not impacted by this kind of a details. But at least we know stress behavior at each location, how it can vary and an impact on the overall global performance. Overall global performance has no significant difference actually. This graph shows that. So I just try to explain that in structural engineering, how we can suggest like a stiffness, which is strongly related to the deflection properties. Uh, to engineers, also connection, the code, lang uh, language, and the equation. Also, several researchers have a very detailed models. Also, that could be used, especially for performance-based design. And also other behaviors like the ductility, the friction behavior, anchor slip behavior, those kind of things. And I want to introduce uh, some of the other uh, related research in terms of a post-tension concrete because uh, uh, my career was focused on the post-tensioning industry and always I'm, I was interested in doing you know, different approaches on con post-tension concrete and it's not much research. So there's a need and not many people are actually doing this. It's a little strange, but uh, that gives more gives me more opportunities and I like it. So uh, corrosion and durability. It's a, it's a more like a material science or maybe uh, it's related to electrical engineering. But with the help of the experts, I did corrosion test for different type of strengths. And durability issues is also very important for post-tensioning, especially uh, you have a lot of uh, failure of the bridges. You, you thought that you have a perfect grouting so that it's uh, protected by the grouting inside a duct, but it's not really. There's always crack and water can come inside with the chloride and that actually makes the strength fracture only after 10 years or 20 years. And it's actually a serious problem. And actually, I think it's uh, one of the serious problems of uh, grouting post tension structures especially uh, infrastructure because it's outdoor, it's uh, more vulnerable to uh, environment. So this research was very helpful, how we can predict the lifetime of the, uh, this kind of stress and how we can mediate those kind of uh, corrosion damage. And also I uh, try to communicate with the engineers, practicing engineers. So they have actually elongation data in the field. So they have a length and then diameter and then strengths of the strand or so profile. Those kind of a data uh, in their computer and with the anonymous uh, uh, project names, I can put out all the database, 20,100 data points. And that helps me to assess the elongation. What elongation tolerance is actually effective, especially for short pendants. For short tendons, small variation of facts like in the performance of the field engineers, they have a disapproval uh, with, the, with some other effects, not by, their, um, uh, not by their fault, but other effects that affects the variability. That's not right for them. So this paper is about the elongation tolerance should be modified to reflect the real condition of the field. This is impact resistant uh, research, high velocity impact. So it's a very, uh, it's like a gun shooting. And 
post tension containment is very popular for silo structures and nuclear containment. I know a lot of nuclear containments in Canada. Actually, almost 100% of them are post tension. So, like aircraft collision or some other missile collision is a important consideration of the design of a nuclear containment. In Seoul National University, we have this kind of equipment. So I, why not post-tensioning? So here we have a post-tensioning bars. Um, the reason I use the post-tensioning bar is that uh, tendon, strand, if it's a short, there's a lot of anchor seating loss. As I said, when it's uh, biting the strand inside the anchor, there's a little bit of suction. But with the short tendon, you lose most of the, maybe 40% of the, 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 the jacking stress. So bar can be used to imitate the pre-compression of the panel. And this is a hollow core missile so that, so more resembling the aircraft. This is a hard, the solid uh, missile. So um, right, right hand side post-tensioning panel, left hand side RC panel with the soft, so, soft missile and the hard missile. Soft missile, it cannot penetrate actually. It's just stuck right over there. The hard missile is just penetrate and it's very strong. So uh, we use this equipment in our Seoul National University. It's very long and its uh, capacity is like 100 kilogram mass with uh, up to 470 meter per second. That's a uh, uh, state of the art equipment. You see that the back of the, uh, um, uh, hold on, maybe I need to, uh, okay. This is the rear face of the, the panel and you see a lot of scabbing of the concrete and then actually penetrate it, especially with the hard missile. This is a type of actually. Um, so that what velocity, what mass, what energy actually can, can cause this kind of a damage. I mean, we got to protect, you know, we got to consider that in our design. That is called beyond design basis event. That is not really the design consideration, but nuclear structure, actually they, they consider that. And that kind of spalling, which was not observed in the RC because it's a hit a little ex, uh, eccentrically. And also um, we, gotta, we gotta assess the data more closely, but concrete was not filled inside a duct. That was also impacting the behavior of this. How about the low velocity impact? When you have a construction, crane can drop the, the heavy mass. Also top floor can drop off to the, the, bo the bottom floor because of a progress collapse. So we actually test using the drop weight machine also state of the art equipment at Seoul National University. You see that the post tensioning tendons are fluctuating after the impact. This is the bottom side of the, uh, the, um, the slab. And as you see RC, actually there's a lot of a spalling at the bottom surface and it's almost like uh, punctuated but our PT damage was uh, uh, minimal. That was a great finding actually, because low velocity impact, low velocity impact is like a 10 meter per second or lower. High velocity means like 250 meter per second. That's more like aircraft collision. This one is more like a dropping the mass. Uh, you have a rock uh, falling from the mountainous area and you have a roof structures or maybe storage of the some um, the, the, the armed magazine storage. It's more like a, the low velocity uh, performance, uh, impact performance and post tensioning was uh, proven to be superior to RC. How about the use of using high strength materials? You see that 1860 megapascal strength, uh, strength that is uh, that has been used more like over the century actually, 270 KSI steel, but they try to use a 350 KSI steel to minimize the number of strength. Actually, uh, that helps a lot, especially with nuclear structure, large scale structure. They are really 
very many strands. And if you reduce the number of strands by using high, higher strength strand, actually there's innovation of the design. So this is a two span structure with the four point lows. And we actually did successfully to show that actually existing equations and models can be used it can be applied exactly the same as the uh, normal strength strength. And in January, actually, like um, uh, only a month ago, we are actually doing shear test. You see that shear span to depth ratio is very short. And post-tensioning structure, of course, uh, uh, it had to be done earlier, but uh, somehow I'm doing right now also. Uh, but shear performance, of course, very complicated behavior. And why this is a painting like this? Because also we use a digital uh, image, uh, the sensor, and actually there's a camera only. And then we try to uh, analyze the the image the in a digital way, so that this is uh, more like a, a to tell the uh, the the um, irregular surface. And also uh, we did the uh, fire test. This is a fire chamber uh, located in the suburban of Seoul. And we had a different type of a uh, concrete slab. One is the multiple strand, bonded system, unbonded system, also grouted unbonded system by use of a uh, plastic coated sheeting. So you see that the uh, chamber high temperature, fire, and finally it's a fractured. And then uh, with the, the applied monotonic loading, actually it's a sustained loading. And you see that the uh, popping of the uh, anchor finally, and we measure actually uh, how long it can last uh, under the certain temperature, given the clear cover to the strand. And that was uh, underway. So I just wanted to introduce a variety of uh, the research in terms of post-tensioning because I have a heart on the subject. And uh, that's why even though it's a little bit of a material science area or maybe the, the fire expert, but I try to do use some of their knowledge incorporating post-tensioning uh, in um, the research that, that actually figure should not be shown right now, but anyway. So I've done a variety of research related PT, including the wind effects too. Uh, wind effects, that's more like a system behavior, like a tall building. And that's a serious uh, uh, effects on tall buildings, especially. And also, it, I know it's uh, number one uh, in the world there at the University of Western Ontario. And also that uh, impacts the, the whole design of a post-tensioning structures as well. Research or study should be fun to yourself. I just wanted to deliver this message. Everybody has a different research, environmental engineers, uh, geotechnical engineers, structural engineers, and you have a specialties. If you really don't like that research, um, that is a problem. You gotta, you gotta, you, uh, it should be a fun to you, okay? Uh, otherwise, uh, it's not really sustainable. Or you change your mind. I mean, um, that is also a very important attitude of uh, uh, your researching, I think. Practical development is important. Always we think about the, how it can be commercialized or uh, suggesting practicing engineers uh, with a better solution. Intellectual, inter, intellectual properties are important. It should be secure. If you have a really good idea, it should be secure by using um, your own patent uh, before it's released. That's very important, but it's more like a general, also it's for the, the whole community. Um, you gotta make sure your research outcome should be disseminated or so eventually it's a codified or standardized. So I'm running this kind of a journal, PTI journal as associate pro editor, and then se several other journals uh, as an editor in chief, because uh, uh, Korean uh, com the institutes uh, actually uh, need my help a lot. But uh, I think uh, you know dissemination of your research outcomes is very important, not only by writing your own thesis, uh, it should be in the public domain. 
um, of, of course, uh, conference proceedings or so web publication. Um, it's also a good domain for dissemination, but for as a scholar, I, I know some of you are actually PhD students or even for master's student, you gotta think about your research, uh, research seriously and it should be uh, endorsed by the professionals, okay? Professional researchers, as well as the engineers, of course. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Any question can be asked now or by email anytime later. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kang.